Good evening. I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Can I have a motion to certify the closed session, please? Madam Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discuss only public business matter lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters were identified in the motion convening that that closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. <coughs> Thank you. Motion passes. All right. That brings us to item 3.01. Uh, public hearing on criteria for redistricting. I'd like to call this public meeting to order. Um, before uh, we call speakers, I'd like to make some clarifying remarks. Uh, the board appreciates all of you being here, and I assure you that all of us want to hear your comments. Everyone here who wishes to speak tonight will have an opportunity to do so, although time may be shortened slightly. Public hearing does not have a time limit on it, therefore it will go as long as necessary to hear your comments within each time allotment. As long as a speaker card was submitted by 6.30, you will be able to speak. For your information, the school board received over 250 comments online and do dozens of emails on this topic. We appreciate the robust public participation thus far. Because of the large amount of public input we have received about redistricting, I would like to make some clarifying remarks before speakers are called. Redistricting is not on our agenda this evening for board discussion. We are here to listen to you tonight. That is our focus. We will continue our deliberations on the topic at our October work session, however, and we will take action on criteria and criteria only at our regular meeting in October. Since the year 2000, James City County has grown nearly 50% in population. That rapid growth coupled by the financial impact of the recession has made it challenging to keep pace with building an educational infrastructure in our community. Consequently, most of the schools in WJCC are near, at, or over capacity. When we benchmark ourselves against similar divisions, divisions that did not grow as fast, we learn that we do not have enough schools. Our neighbor York County, for instance, has only 1,200 more children, but four more schools than we do. I share that information in hopes that you will understand the context in which this school board is working. By state law, the school board cannot raise its own revenue and must rely exclusively on James City County and the city of Williamsburg for money to build schools. We can ask, but asking does not always result in funds to build new educational facilities. We are grateful to be building a new middle school that will open next year, and we are redistricting middle, the middle school level to prepare for that. Because capacity at the high schools is imbalanced because of the rapid growth we have experienced since the last high school redistricting 10 years ago, and that growth has not aligned with our attendance zone boundaries, and because the cost to add the high school process to the consultant's work was reasonable, the board contracted with them to develop criteria to draw three maps that will depict different potential attendance zones at the high school level. The board has not decided to rezone high school. The board may decide to do that, and it may not. That decision has not been made yet and will be made early in the new year, but not now. Tonight's hearing is on criteria for redistricting, a definite redistricting at middle school and a possible redistricting at high school. So remarks should be limited to that topic only. Criteria can include items such as feeder patterns, which boundaries to use to establish, establish attendance zones, boundaries such as neighborhoods, for instance, proximity to the nearest school, the amount of student disruption, variances in building capacity, socioeconomic balance, and other related items. If you have submitted a speaker card and your remarks are not directly related to criteria for redistricting, when Mrs. Taylor reads your card, please stay seated and she will move to the next speaker. We do want to hear from everyone, but if your comments are not related to criteria for redistricting, the appropriate time to make your remarks would be during the citizen comment part of our regular meeting, which follows this public hearing. Items about specific neighborhoods or whether to redistrict high school at all should be made at that time and not during this public hearing. 
If Mrs. Taylor calls your name and you stay seated because your remarks are not specific to criteria for redistricting, your card will be transferred to the citizen comment pile and your name will be called again at that time later in the meeting. Assuming my colleagues on the board do not object, I will extend the public comment period as appropriate. Thank you for your understanding of our public hearing processes. We appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing from all of you, and we value your input. Tonight, we have 34 speaker cards, and therefore, everyone will have two minutes to make the remarks. If your remarks were planned and were longer than that, than, than two minutes, please submit your comments to Ms. Serza, our board clerk. She will then forward them to us, or please feel free to email us. Um, and if your remarks were longer and you would like to show solidarity with someone who's speaking for two minutes, please feel free to quietly stand. Um, that is fine to, to indicate to us that you are in agreement. If you are in the overflow room and you submitted a card and you would like to speak, please come when your name is called. We may go to the next speaker, but then we will call your name again because we do want to hear from everyone. So with that, Mrs. Hummel, will you please read our speaker guidelines, and then Mrs. Taylor will call names. Thank you. Okay, let me get to that part. Sorry, I was listening intently to you. Okay, here we go. Now is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker in this public commentary is allocated two minutes. Time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you. Deborah Bebelt. Madam Chair and School Board, thank you for the opportunity to speak for you today. My name is Deborah Bebout, and I am excited about the existing partnership between our schools and families, which has made Williamsburg, James City County, one of the most attractive school districts in the region with comparable to graduation completion indices at all three high schools. Today, I want to bring to your attention that uh, other communities in Virginia have used uh, reasons for adjusting attending area, attendance areas that include the localities associated with uh, schools in terms of the proximity of schools to student residencies, walking distances, impact on neighborhoods, continue, contiguous school attendance areas, and the frequency of previous changes for affected neighborhoods when redistricting. That is from Stafford schools and from the Henrico schools that one of their priorities or objectives has been to maintain the concept of geographic zoning for schools, which encourages the participation and involvement of geographically contiguous communities. Uh, the ability to carpool with my neighbors to schools for after school events enables my children to have a more enriched opportunities throughout their schools. It has made being part of a community very important to me and one of the things that I really value and hope that you will treasure in the redistricting process. In addition, I'd like to bring to your attention that there are schools in Virginia that have been uh, allowing for grandfathering with a thoughtful policy for siblings within the state. In, in RICO schools, they've done it at both the middle school level and at the high school level. Uh, minimizing the disruption to families. And I have these handouts. Thank you. Dr. John Whitley.
Good evening. I'm John Whitley. I live at 110 Governor Berkeley Road in the city of Williamsburg. I'm speaking to the criteria of race. I believe in fair and equitable distribution of financial, physical, organization, organizational, and human resources in public schools and everywhere. I believe in the worth and dignity of black folk. I believe in black lives matter. I believe black folks, folk must be in positions to have significant influence in decision making in public education and everywhere. I believe public schools should be environments where an equal educational outcomes and equal employment outcomes are expected as a natural order. I suspect that as you look at the criteria that you bring forward, that you must look through the lens to make certain that in no way is systemic racism affecting the decision making. Racism only destroys equal educational outcomes and equal employment outcomes, and it destroys the worth and dignity of black children and adults. I demand decisions about the fair and equitable placement and inclusion of black students and adults in WJCC to avoid racism. I demand that black children and adults within JCC be protected under the full extent of the law and enjoy the benefits of equal educational outcomes and equal employment outcomes. I do have confidence that you seated there will move with fair and equitable understanding of the issue of race as a major criteria and that you will not permit anyone, either those designing or those making decisions, to negatively impact the importance, the significance, and the place of black folk in our school system and in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whitley. Dana Middleton. Good evening. My name is Dana Middleton, and I would like to say that a lot of time and energy has been spent determining how we redistrict, whether or not we have not analyzed whether we should. So as one of the criteria that I would suggest we look at is a bigger picture. No matter what criteria you and the rest of the board take upon you, whether it is overcrowdedness, whether it is socioeconomic and racial diversity, whether it is vicinity, whether it is intact neighborhoods, there are three questions to determine whether or not it is a wise choice. The first question is, what is the stated purpose? Ostensibly tonight, you finally stated that it is perhaps due to overcrowdedness at one particular high school versus the other, one more than the others. However, redistricting serves as a means to what end? If we don't answer that right, a wise choice cannot be made. You've spent a lot of money or allotted a lot of money from a pressed budget to accomplish something that we don't quite know why. The second is, does it solve the problem? As many in the, in the room will notice, if the goal is to alleviate the overcrowdedness and you get everything right, socioeconomic, diversity, vicinity, intact neighborhoods, and bring everything into seamless equity, you will then move from one overcrowded high school to three. At which point, with an even distribution, each high school will have 97% capacity. And in five years, based on our own projections, we will now be sitting at 105% capacity. Bulging at the seams. Rezoning now creates more problems than it solves. The final question on determining the wisdom of a choice with redistricting is whether or not this is the right time. In short, the answer is no. Your own capital improvement plan shows that in 2022, we are slated for a new high school. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wendy Musameshi. Why does this do this? Sorry, guys. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair and school board members. My name is Wendy Musumechi. I'm a resident of James City County. 
I would like to urge the school board this evening to consider diversity as a top criteria for redistricting. There are multiple ways integration of schools can be beneficial for all students. There is a rich body of research that shows that diverse classrooms teach some of the most important skills our children need, which frankly matter more than test scores. This includes curiosity, cross-collaboration, resilience, empathy, and gratitude. These are essential elements to a productive and successful life. What better foundation could we ask for our children? I would argue that the backlash against some of the discussions around the criteria and redistricting is clear evidence that there is a problem and that our schools are not balanced. And I would also ask last that the board please consider <clears throat> continuing to have transparency and also consider the possibility of more public hearings due to the significant response of community members to this process. Thank you. Richard Tisdale. Hi, my name is Richard Tisdale. I'm a native of Williamsburg and a resident of Powhatan Secondary. And I want to talk about the urgency of redistricting now, in particular for two criteria. Capacity is a non-urgent criteria, as only Jamestown is over capacity. Yet, it is the highest achieving school. Balancing population among the three high schools results in 97% capacity for all, which only spreads the problem and increases the cost. FRP balance is non-compelling also at this time, as high schools share graduation rates of over 90%. College attendance rates range from 77% at Jamestown to 85% at Lafayette. Manufacturing perfect balance is a well-meaning but ultimately bad idea. U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development con concluded that socioeconomic relocation had, quote, no detectable effects on math and reading achievement, as shown at mtoresearch.org. The Nonprofit Education Trust annually recognizes low-income, high-achievement schools that share common traits. These traits are supported by researchers at the Universities of California and Georgia that found, quote, after controlling for the effects of so school policies and practices, the socioeconomic composition had no significant impact on student learning. They went on to write, the impact of socioeconomic composition was explained by four school characteristics. Teacher expectations, the amount of homework that students do, the number of rigorous courses that students take, and students' feelings about the safety of the school. Please don't do more harm than good with unnecessary disruption in the critical high school years. Wait until a new high school is built and focus on policy that results in success for all students, regardless of the school they attend. Thanks. Mr. Tisdale. Alex Coltrane. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Alex Coltrane. I'm a James City County resident in the neighborhood of Monticello Woods. And I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about a few things tonight. And I think we've talked a lot about capacity and redistricting. And, and I think we share the same views on that with regards to uh, overcrowding as an issue. I believe this board is looking at various options, whether it's building a fourth high school or potential add-ons. Uh, we believe that any short-term redistricting is going to just kind of put a Band-Aid on the problem at this point. Uh, second, secondly, one of the criteria is proximity. Uh, we think it's important to consider proximity when you're looking at redistricting. Uh, there's a sense of value with a neighborhood school. Uh, you've got a lot of young folks that are new drivers that, that you know, we don't want them driving further than they need to. Uh, and I've got a letter which I would ask to submit to the board. Uh, there's transportation studies that talk about busing. And the further the bus goes, the more likelihood of fatalities and serious injuries are in busing situations. You know, one of the last things we want to talk about is cost and, and cost to our students and cost to uh, the last years of high school, the first years of college, and being able to uh, stay in your school district, stay into a situation where you're most prepared to go to the next level. 
Thank you. If I could hand this up, that'd be great. Sir, is this here? Helen Murphy. Hi, thank you, school board, <clears throat> for um, being here tonight and listening to our concerns. Um, I'm a Helen Murphy, and I live in Williamsburg. I'd like to start by saying that I'm heartened by the number of people who have come to take part in this discussion about redistricting priorities, and I'm disappointed by the fact that there is only one public meeting about this. I understand we're just in the stage of drawing maps, but it's important to get community involvement because once the maps are drawn, it's too late to change the criteria. I also find myself wondering when are we going to build this new high school. I know and I believe in our hearts that we all want the best for our children. In my opinion, much of the pushback to redistricting the high school stems from the fact that Jamestown is perceived to be a better high school than the other two. Why else would we be arguing that it should be the only high school to be overcrowded? A quick Zillow home search will tell you that because school rankings are posted there. My own experience moving to Williamsburg told me that. I was pregnant and many people told me to buy a house in the Jamestown High School District. There are people in our community who have purchased homes specifically to be zoned at certain schools. They will be hurt by redistricting. Changing schools and plans is disruptive and hard for families. I am deeply sympathetic to my fellow community members. Um, but we're forced into thinking about redistricting because we have disparities among our schools and it is a problem for our whole community. It's one that the school board created in the last redistricting and one that the school board needs to fix by considering socioeconomic diversity as a main criterion. We're all better off when we don't need to fight with one another about who gets to go to the quote unquote good school. As people make decisions about where to live, we as a community are reinforcing these disparities. The school board needs to understand that doing nothing is in fact not the least disruptive or least costly alternative. There are real families and children hurt by educational disparities. Our school budget provides finances on a per student basis, so schools under capacity do not in fact have more resources. I encourage you to come up with creative solutions, whether grandfathering students into redistricting plans or start zoning new boundaries only for rising ninth graders and maybe have buses from a given neighborhood stop at two schools, whatever. Um, my time is up. There we go. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Jamie Ibrahim? Good evening, my name is Jamie Ibrahim. Um, I live in Governor's Land and I'm a parent of two children. Um, I, like many of the speakers here, um, disagree with the idea of redistricting the high schools at this point, but as I understand it, that's not really what we're to discuss in this public hearing. So I would like to address um, what I believe to be the most important overarching criteria. You're going to hear many criteria. They're very important. I don't want to minimize any of those, but I think if you get away from reasonable proximity to schools, then you're going to see unintended consequences. Now I say reasonable proximity because when it starts to become unreasonable, then you have parents who start making different choices and you might undermine the goals that you were setting out to accomplish. For example, in Governor's Land, we're approximately 2.5 miles from Jamestown High School. Lafayette is 7.6 miles and Warhill is nine miles away from our neighborhood. So if you redistrict our neighborhood, for example, away from Jamestown for a variety of other factors or reasons, you're going to have double or triple the time um, on the bus. You're going to have students just learning to drive, um, going through back roads late, you know, early in the morning. Um, you're going to have a variety of safety and wellness issues. Um, so I think that's really important for the board to continue to consider are all of these consequences that might follow. Um, the bus for Jamestown High School already shows up in our neighborhood at 6.30 in the morning. If you are going to send us twice as far or three times as far, how early does the bus need to come? 6.10? 6.15? There are numerous studies showing that that undermines the wellness of our high school students. Um, starting school at 7 in the morning has been shown to be problematic. And then if you get the students up and at the bus stop at 6.10, 6.15, it really does become a wellness issue. Um, another speaker addressed the safety issue of busing them twice or three times as far. Um, so I would really encourage the, the board to consider that um, as an overarching factor, not to undermine any other factor. I think they're all very important. Um, but once you get away from the reasonableness, um, then you see issues. Thank you, Ms. Ibrahim. Tony Small.
Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members. I'm Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams, founder of The Village. The Village is an organization formed to promote unity and education. I am sure many will come forward tonight with studies and concerns about the upcoming redistricting as parents and members of our community. I am here to address redistricting as it relates to the mission of the village. In keeping with our mission, we are here to be a part of the process through advocating for equity, diversity, and lowering of the achievement gap in our schools as we embark on the process of redistricting. We are hoping to continue with an open and transparent process to include everyone. We would like to have a clear understanding of the criteria used for the upcoming redistricting. We strive to maintain schools that are reflective of our community. If you look around this room, you'll see that we are a very, very diverse community. And that is what we strive for. We want to work in partnership with our entire community and the schools to prepare every student for life beyond the classroom in a diverse society, in the, college, in the colleges, and in the workforce. Thank you to Williamsburg James City County Schools. We will continue to work with you and advocate for our youth and our families and continue to work to build programs tutoring children, mentoring to children, to all children. And we won't leave anyone out. We will remember all children, children of color, children with disabilities, children who don't speak English. We will remember all of those students. And yet, it does not matter how the lines are drawn or where they are drawn. What really matters is equity. Equity versus equality. Equity means that everybody gets, not just everybody gets the same, but every child gets what he and she needs. And that does not matter what building you're in or where the lines are drawn. And if we do not promote and maintain equity Thank you, and Ms. cultural Williams. and diversity understanding, we have failed. And I believe in this school board and this chair and this superintendent. And I thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Donald Ferguson. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, members of the board, I'm a resident of James City County. I'm a graduate of Lafayette High School from a year that I won't mention out loud. <laughs> and the one thing that I have always felt about my time at Lafayette and in the Williamsburg James City County Schools that I was most proud of was the fact that we were fully integrated. My friends in Richmond went to schools that were not, or they went to private schools. When I was here, there was only one high school. And I think I was actually fortunate for that, but I would not have told you that at the time. But having everyone attend the same school or a school that is equal to all of the others is a value. And having a school whose population resembles Williamsburg, including the York County part, if it had to, that is a value. A school that doesn't do that or is a little out of balance with that should be avoided. I think having the criteria set so that the schools are equally or evenly distributed for all of the members of the Williamsburg area is the most important criteria. Proximity is important, but then again, the two high schools are only a thousand feet apart, so it's not much of an argument. Lafayette and Warhill. I think if the criteria moves in a strange direction or you end up with an odd map that has pieces and parts that don't really fit, you should fix that. And if one of the high schools or two of the high schools are seen as less than, that deserves more money. I think you should be able to do that. And I know you don't have the power to tax, but have the strength to tell people that they need to pay for education. They might tell their kids they're happy they saved 10 cents per $100 on their property taxes, but he's sorry he didn't get as good an education as he could have. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Daisy Kern Shearer. Hi, thank you. I'm Stacey Kern Shear, uh, resident of Williamsburg. 
As a community responsible for our children and their success, we cannot deny or minimize the achievement gap between economically disadvantaged students and the student body as a whole. This gap is glaringly clear when you look at the SOL pass rates, not graduation rates, the SOL pass rates. This gap is disproportionately affecting students of color. This gap is exacerbated by a system that results in a concentration of economically disadvantaged students together, but yet allocates funding on a per student basis in the schools. Although allocating funding on a per student basis sounds equitable in theory, right now in practice it is not. I appreciate that moving students around is disruptive to students, to parents, to schools. It is not a trivial matter and it should absolutely be avoided as much as possible. But I ask that we take a step back and take a different look at what is disruption. What else is disruptive to student success? It is disruptive to student success when schools lack the resources that are vital to address the achievement gap and provide all students the tools they need. <clears throat> it is disruptive when teachers are spread too thin, unable to give all students essential time, instruction, and attention. It is disruptive when a student who is struggling cannot access the resources he or she needs to learn and succeed. These disruptions are happening now in our school. The, act, the impact of these systemic issues stay with students long after graduation because despite graduating, they do not have the skills they need for a secure future. To do the hard work toward a more fair, equitable, and balanced system, I hope that the school, will, school board will, re, will work to reflect, um, that the schools reflect our community and its diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shearer. Max Katz. Good evening, I'm Max Katz, resident of Williamsburg. The vision of all-inclusive public education that we take for granted today was born during the era of radical reconstruction. Former slaves tasting freedom for the first time saw public education as a fundamental guarantor of real democracy and worked to establish the first public schools in the South. Of course, their vision of inclusive public education was thwarted by 100 years of Jim Crow segregation. Today, despite the landmark 1954 Supreme Court decision that ruled public school segregation, quote, inherently unequal, the nation's schools are even more racially segregated than they were in the 1970s, and economic segregation in schools has risen dramatically over the past two decades. However, in 100 districts and charters throughout the country today, brave and visionary school boards have returned to the founding vision crafted during Radical Reconstruction in, uh, of educational inclusivity by pursuing socioeconomic school integration. Join with them. Fulfill your honored role as the custodians of the freedom dreams of this country. Thank you. Jennifer Bickham Mendez. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school board. My name is Jennifer Bickham Mendez, and I'm a resident of James City County. I wish to add my voice to those who urge you to use redistricting, which is necessary due to our schools that are near or at or even over capacity, as an opportunity to also address racial and socioeconomic disparities among our schools. The addition of a new middle school gives the school board the chance to ensure that each middle school has about the same social diversity as the school district. Similarly, Alleviating overcrowding in Jamestown High School also presents the opportunity for the school board to achieve the same level of race and socioeconomic integration across high schools. Diversity benefits all students. And as a sociologist, I believe strongly that Jamestown's demographic homogeneity does not serve the students there well or prepare them for navigating racially and culturally diverse work settings. Finally, concentrating more affluent students in one school also concentrates other less visible resources, like booster clubs and PTSAs that draw from a pool of parents with more race resources and often greater ability to participate. Please consider the importance of making our schools reflect the broader WJCC community when redistricting. And finally, the idea that redistricting would necessarily disrupt students' lives to catastrophic results is not based on concrete evidence. 
I refer the school board to my colleague at William, uh, my colleague at William and Mary, Dr. Sal Saparito, a leading scholarly voice on the issue of school zoning. His research, which was presented to the school board, demonstrates that the typical person in the WJCC school district lives in close proximity to people from a variety of backgrounds at the geographic scale of three, to f three or four school zones and that this level of diversity is easily achievable in our schools by the thoughtful creation of compact attendance zones. Thank you. Amy Quark. <clears throat> Hello, Amy Quark. Um, I'm a parent, and it is my job as a parent to do the best to help my children succeed and I think that many of us here today feel that way. But the job of the school board is to make sure that all of our children are getting a good education and right now that is not the case. We have serious achievement gaps. If we look at SOL pass rates overall there's a 19 point gap between economically disadvantaged students and the student body as a whole in reading, a 15 point gap in math, the achievement gaps between white and African American students are even more pronounced and at particular schools we see much, much greater gaps. Um, now redistricting will not solve the achievement gap on its own. This will require a range of policies um, including hiring more minority teachers. But redistricting is an important piece of the puzzle. Students who require more resources to succeed, like instruction time by teachers, are concentrated in certain schools. 33% of Lafayette students qualify for free and reduced lunch, compared to just 16% at Jamestown. These, uh, this disparity is more pronounced at the middle school level. But these schools are not getting more resources. Evening out the proportion of economically disadvantaged students within each school through redistricting would help to balance out access to resources. But this isn't just about closing the achievement gap. If you concentrate students with higher needs at one school, but you don't match that with higher resources, the more affluent kids at that school suffer too. We are all concerned about our own children's education. But doesn't a minority student in our schools deserve the same chance to succeed as our white students? Don't our poorer students deserve the same chance as our more affluent students? Doesn't a student at Lafayette deserve the same quality education as a student at Jamestown? These are the questions our school board needs to prioritize as we move forward in redistricting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quirk. Brian Smalls. <laughs> Madam Chair, board members. Uh, my name is Brian Smalls, and I'm a resident of the city of Williamsburg. I am the president of the York James City Williamsburg chapter of the NAACP. I'm a proud graduate of Lafayette High School. I will say that I was done in 1999. <laughs> 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 I'm sure I will. Um, but most importantly, I'm a proud father of a third and fifth grader at Claire Bird Baker Elementary School here in uh, Williamsburg. Now, in, in not being redundant, a lot of what I want to talk about has been talked about already. I want to talk about, I think redistricting is necessary. I think it's a situation where we need transparency with the process in general. I think it's a situation where we should have more public hearings. I think it's a situation where, as you can see, it is a very, very important topic here. I want to talk about one of the things that's been talked about in regards to uh, having higher needs at particular schools, but not having the resources to meet those things. We do things on a per student basis for funding, and yet we don't tackle the individual needs. So if we, if we have schools that have higher needs, for example, reading um, is lower at certain schools among students. I think it's a situation where, from a standpoint of having the resources at those schools to accommodate the needs for those individual schools, I think that's very important. Now, I also believe that we can have excellence and equity at the same time. I don't believe it's a situation where we, they are um, independent of one another. I think it's a situation if we strive to have excellence and equity together, I think it's something that we can accomplish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smalls. Philip Canaday. <laughs> Okay, Harmony Douglish. <laughs> Good 
Hello, I'm Harmony Dalglish. I'm a resident of Williamsburg. Um, a lot of the things that I wanted to say tonight have already been said, so I'm just going to reiterate a couple. Um, and a new thing, I think that we're arg arguably at the most critical part of this process, which is defining what our criteria are going to be. Because the maps that they give us will only be as good as we tell them that our priorities are. And so I'm really going to urge you and charge you to, to prioritize these. We've, I know we've heard a lot of discussion about different types of criteria, but what do we value? That's what we need to decide and we need to set. We can't just wait and see what the maps look like and then decide we have to tell them what we want. Um, our values, what our values are. So I urge you to set very clear priorities. I know that's not going to be an easy discussion. Um, I also want to urge you to make um, socioeconomic and racial diversity a top priority, um, to put that one at the top of the list because I think it will address some of the issues with the achievement gap. It's not a magic bullet, um, but it will, um, it is a first step and an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and lastly, I think like most of my neighbors here, I want excellent schools for all of our children, and I know that that's a goal that we're trying to work towards. So I'd urge you to make clear priorities and make socioeconomic and racial diversity the top of that list. Thank you. Catherine Barco Alva. Corey Bittram. Good evening. My name is Corey Buttram. Thank you for hearing my comments this evening. Um, first, I do want to say that I encourage you to hold more public hearings. I believe that everyone um, deserves an opportunity to be heard, and we do have people in this community who were unable to be here tonight and also may not have access to Internet to fill out the, um, the survey that you've offered. Uh, I'm the parent of an eighth grader at Berkeley Middle School. My daughter is zoned for Jamestown High School, and she hopes to play on the volleyball team there. Um, and like many people in this room, I purchased my home because of the schools that we're zoned for. However, I know that if we are zoned into another school, she will be okay. Our children are resilient. This, they will not be traumatized by rezoning. Uh, we cannot allow the makeup of our schools to be determined by a few neighborhoods. We must do what's best for the entire community, even if we inconvenience some. Students have sh studies have shown that greater socioeconomic diversity benefits low-income students without negatively affecting high-income students. Students learn most from people who are not like them, and many times this includes people who don't live in the same neighborhood. I'm asking that you consider diversity, both racial and socioeconomic, as a top criterion for redistricting both the middle and high school. Thank you. Jessica Carter. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Jessica Carter. I'm a parent of students in the schools here in Williamsburg, James City County. My father, myself, and my children have proudly graduated from Lafayette. In regards to redistricting, I'm addressing the criteria of safety and equality. People learn about people, life, and experience through interaction and integration not through segregation. Getting the communities in an uproar or throwing advocacy corporations under the bus is an inappropriate attempt in attaining this goal. I would like that the board to explain to the families of this community how you expect to keep our children safe when you have schools at a capacity of 112%, um, close to 80% Caucasian, dangerously outnumbering minorities and other groups at public school events. I myself witnessed a mob of fighting students from a rival high school rushing the Lafayette side of a football game, placing families, children, elderly in danger. All of this over territories. This is at the fault of adults and the current zoning. Our children are at risk. Our youth are in danger. And we need to fairly and diversely redistrict our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. John Rio for you. Congratulations for pronouncing it correctly. It doesn't happen that often. In 2015, like all of you, I wanted to make my vision of excellence in education and make it a reality by winning a seat at the table, that table. Unlike all of you, however, I lost. <laughs> After I lost the election, I looked around for a place to do the real work of improving our school system. I chose then, and continue to choose, to work alongside the village for the simple fact that they want to talk less and do more. 
The village is locked in on the fact that the achievement gap that marked the WJCC schools of the 80s continues through today. Segregation ended 63 years ago, and yet, if you're willing to stray from your daily commute or your children's activities, you'll find that Williamsburg is perhaps as segregated now as it was then. Our neighborhoods are segregated. Our places of worship are segregated. And our schools, based on the most current data, are segregated. Reasonable proximity goes hand in hand with segregation. We might not want to talk about race and socioeconomic status and segregation, but it's real. The village speaks loud and clear. The status quo isn't good enough. A WJCC school system that is great for some kids yet fails other kids is not good enough. Redistricting that favors the status quo over meaningful change is not good enough. We as a community, patting ourselves on the back for our good school system while failing the same kinds of students year after year, choosing narrow self-interest over the good of all students, we have not been good enough. You, members of our school board, past and present, have not been good enough. If you ran, like I did, to make a real difference in the lives of children, then stand up for them. Be brave in the face of narrow self-interest, make the tough decisions, and urge all of us, parents, students, administrators, retirees, Thank taxpayers, you. Thank you, Mr. Rear, to be your... better. Thank you. Rochelle Johnson. Kelsey Smoot. Glenn Jones. Nairuti Jastri. William Riley. Beth Chambers. Hello, Madam Chair and School Board. Thank you guys so much. And we have a really awesome community. I just want to thank everybody who's spoken so far. Um, really appreciate it. I live in the city. I am kind of old, so my parent, my kids are done. But I'm um, still in the community. And I want to just, and I went through the last redistricting, and um, I want to say we really do have a problem. And it was started back then. People didn't mean bad. You end up, though, with only three maps, just three maps. One of them is awful. One of them is like, OK, I guess, and there would be another one. Like, and so you guys, it's really important they draw them right. And the criteria, I felt like one of them was just like punishing our group or something. It's like, everybody's going to have that feeling. So um, it's really important to get the criteria right. And I know this, this diversity, socioeconomic diversity has been brought up just as like along with these other things. But it really is key. It really is key. And we do have a problem. And we can see it, again, So I mentioned the Zillow, the housing thing, and I've just heard more and more stories. Like, oh yeah, the realtor, they said, they steered me away from that area. And people are now frightened of being redistricted, you know? And I just, I can imagine, like, they're like my people. They're upper middle class, you know, well-educated people, and they have this nice house, and I don't have the nice house, but anyway, so. <laughs> but, uh, it's, um, but anyway, I know these people. They're my people. So, and I don't want them scared. And no one should be scared of redistricting. It should be like a wonderful, great opportunity. Our middle schools, which I'll be talking about, are, have the least, had the most problem in terms of um, distribution of socioeconomic uh, population. And so that's, that's a really big problem. So you're going to, I think it's, it's not just one criteria of many, it's a really key criteria. And yeah, people, they'll say, oh, I had to drive, I had to drive. A lot of us, you know, we have people who live far away. You chose to live, you know, you are, and we have rural people. But also, when you talk about community, I know there was a discussion, communities, we have these homeowners associations. That was really what they relied on last time. We want to keep this homeowners association thing, or the people who are in this pool swimming team or something. But I don't think that's a good criteria. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. Natoya Haskins? Hello, my name is Dr. Natoya Haskins, and I am a faculty member at the College of William & Mary in the School of Education. I'm also a parent of a five-year-old who is starting at DJ Montague this year as a kindergartner. 
And I'm also a Lafayette graduate. My main concern is equity in education. Um, I hear the voices of people talking about having to drive um, an extra five or 10 minutes. And it's disheartening um, when you have children in other schools that are having situations where there, are, there is less resources being given. Um, and one of the ways to address this disproportionality is to create more diverse schools in terms of income levels, race and ethnicity. We don't have to be afraid. This allows students of all backgrounds to have access to advanced quality teachers, consistent administration, and researchers also talk about the importance of looking at free and reduced lunch numbers and socioeconomic status again as having an impact on higher turnover of teachers and administrators and negatively impacting the social and emotional development. Every student in the school division is depending on you to make the right decision and to have an impact on positively influencing their future. Students of color, low income students want and need a great education too. Black students matter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haskins. Richard Chu. Lauren Steffen. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm not going to address op topics that have already been discussed, but I do want to address something more in a different point. I do not believe redistricting solves the problems being brought up regarding the amount of free or reduced lunch kids. And I'm curious as to why that is being used as a measure of determining what is good or not good for a school. As a minority, I resent children being classified by their race or ethnicity. Someone keeps posting on the Williamsburg James City Facebook page stats on how whites are performing versus Latinos, versus blacks, and versus various schools in our district. Also, I recall seeing a study in our district that laid out the expectations of the students based on ethnicity. Asians were expected to perform the best, but for whatever reason, they weren't included in that study, while blacks were at the bottom. That, to me, is injustice. Not for anything, but I think all of our brains are gray, with the same capacity to learn. Also, what about the mixed ethnicities? My girls are half Asian, half Caucasian. What do you do in that situation? Do you average them? I mean, it just becomes ludicrous. <laughs> so, you know, you know, where do they fit in? I'm, I'm at, I just think it's absolutely absurd. If I was black, I would be furious to have seen that study and to think that you expect less out of my children. So, um, the brains of black children have just as much capacity to learn as the brains of any other child in a different ethnicity. So why all these divisive studies? Also, poor people have as much ability to learn as spoiled rich kids. If they don't get parental help or guidance at home, that is where we should be focused on, providing educational help to those who need it, rich or poor, black or white, yellow, red, or some mix of them all. I volunteered to do this many times. High school or even middle school honor students could get volunteer hours for helping tutor students that are struggling. It's that whole village concept that I firmly believe in. I hope you consider this. Richard Chu. Thank you, Madam Chair and the Board. Uh, my name is Richard Chu. I'm a resident of James City County. I'm also a professor at Virginia State University, an historically black college high above the Appomattox River in Petersburg, Virginia. Been there for 14 years, advocating for our students, encouraging our presidents and our admission staffs to look hard at Williamsburg because we have excellent students. So far, it's been an easy sell. The board is contemplating a move that's gonna make my job a whole lot harder. 
if in fact we decide to forcibly re relocate current students in high school. This eventuality can be easily avoided if the board simply agrees to rezone only rising ninth graders over the next three years. It's the right approach, it's the just approach, and it's an approach that does embrace two substantial bodies of social science, each compelling and each worth the board's attention. The first, and they've been talked about, is that forcibly relocating current students will have an adverse effect on their academic performance. The second is that socioeconomic variances do have a tendency to produce variances between schools. But right now, those variances do not exist. The achievement gap that has been talked about here tonight is across the entire district and requires creativity on your part in order to address it. Relocating people right now is not a silver bullet that's actually going to solve that issue. It means that we don't have an immediate crisis that requires us to forcibly relocate students. And the ones who are going to get hurt the worst are the ones who are free and reduced lunch students who require assistance that they have built up over a couple of years that is going to be ripped away from them with only a couple of semesters to put it back together. And in the words of one of my own students, and I'm grateful to her to point it out to me, a lot of these kinds of assistance networks require trust that only can be built over a couple of years. It doesn't matter just how much we care in terms of trying to help, we have to build those avenues for trust and you're going to take them away if you redistrict current students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Kurt Carlson. Leanne Quinn. <gasps> Hi, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Leanne Quinn, and I am a new resident of Williamsburg, James City County. My voice is going to shake because I'm nervous. Um, I have um, two kiddos. They are um, in elementary school. And I'll tell you, in all honesty, my family did about three years of research before moving to um, Williamsburg. We left our community of 14 years coming here trusting that Williamsburg Public Schools would give our children the best education that we could provide. I guarantee you, no realtor put us in one direction. It was research that us as parents did, trying to find what was best for our children. And my idea of redistricting the high schools does not fix our problems. We will all be at 97% capacity, and then we'll just be right in the same position in a few years doing this all over again, causing more stress on our community and families and children. Um, I do believe that proximity should be a priority in your criteria. My job as a mama is to keep my babies safe. And if they are driving um, very early mornings, um, longer distances than needed with deer or they're on a bus, for longer times, already we have bus issues. I don't think that's the best interest of our children, and that should be considered. Um, as parents, we trust you with, with our babies, and we hope that you would take every consideration in their safety and wellness when you make these decisions. I urge the board to come up with a long-term plan for this problem, something that we're not going to have to address every three or four years as our populations um, get larger. Thank you. Ms. Quinn. Beth Luger. Um, Kurt Carlson. Kurt Carlson. Kurt Carlson. Yes. Speak up. Kluger. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kurt Carlson. I'm a new resident of Williamsburg. Madam Chair, committee members, Julie, thank you for hearing my comments. Several of the comments here tonight have been about considering the unit of analysis as the society. I, I want to focus it on the children. And so I'm going to just talk about the two children I know best, my daughter and my son. If they were here and they heard this, they would be happy to help because it's just in their nature. And so they would say, yeah, I'll pitch in however, however you want me to. 
But I think that if you push them a little bit harder, they might say, uh, why is it the kids that are always responsible for fixing the problems that the adults don't seem to be able to fix? Would, would we all agree to uh, just randomly have the house that we live in moved from one neighborhood to another? If we went to a restaurant and ordered our food, would it be okay if someone just switched the plate on us because we didn't think that it was distributed fair? I think my kids would say, look, we, we want to pitch in, but we're not sure that the kids should bear the brunt of trying to fix the things at the societal level. So let's focus at the kid level. What would my children say about the achievement gap? They would say, to be honest, Dad, I learned how to read at home. The reason I'm at the top of my class in math is because you drilled me in my multiplication tables after second grade before I went into third grade, and I hated you for it that summer. But I came out on top. At school, I learned how to socialize. I learned how to fit in. I learned how to build friends. I would say, what do you think about being moved, son? And he would say, if you move me next year, that'll be my second school in two years. Then I'll go to high school, that'll be my third. And with the threat of redistricting, the high school, it could be four. And count the one I came from, that's five. That could be five schools in five years. That's a lot of change, Dad. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you. Amy Baker. Christina Jean. Oh, she's not okay. William Riley. Christina. My name is Christina Jean. I live in James City County. It's okay if you pronounce it wrong, everyone else does too. Um, I'm here to talk about the high school redistricting. We're a military family, so resiliency is a huge word in our family. We've moved a lot. Um, my kids have had to adapt to change. We did our research before we moved here to try to get the proximity and the diversity and all the things that you've listed and these people have talked about, and we chose the place we live because we wanted one thing. My kids to have something in common when we retired. So my oldest is gonna graduate from the high school this year. Her sister's a sophomore, but I have an eighth grader. She's a rising ninth grader next year. So talking about just the high school and, and allowing them to grandfather, that's great. But my priority is mostly with my eighth grader because she's gone and she's given up quite a few things. So the one thing I would hope that you would look at when you're redistricting, hopefully you won't do it this time. You'll wait for another school and you'll wait for the big picture, like one of the men said earlier. But the disruption, my kids are very involved, like the man before me. My kids are very involved. They are in the National Honor Society. They're in Spanish Honor Society. They tutor other children after school. Math Honor Society, which they also tutor kids after school. They're in the running team. They compete on a high level. They have ownership in their school. They have pride in their school. Had we picked another school, they probably would have had pride in that one too. They form communities within their own schools, and they have teachers that they have recommendations for. My oldest is applying to West Point. If we had to move in the middle of her high school year, which is why we retired here to not do that, she wouldn't have most of the things that she needs for that application. To be quite honest, I don't know if she'd even have a chance to get in, because she's reaching, they give criteria, you have to have this teacher from your last math, and you have to have this teacher from that place, and um, the different criteria is really hard to get into those top schools. She's worked really hard for that. Thank you, Michelle. Please look into that, thank you. Laura Johnson.
Madam Chair, um, Dr. Heron, and members of the board, my name is Laura Johnson, and I'm a parent of two high school students and resident of Green Springs West. Um, I've volunteered at each step along the way of my kids' um, past because we've had to move a number of times as well. And the issue of rezoning is even more meaningful to me. Uh, the way I look at it right now is rezoning high school students shouldn't be done without a long-term plan to address impending future occupancy issues. Rezoning now is not a long-term solution. Rezoning now is going to have an impact, a negative impact, on every child. Because this isn't a solution, it's just a band-aid um, to cover capacity issues. We're not looking out for the safety and stability um, for, our, for our school community in general. Our Green Springs West community and um, WJCC in general have a large number of military families, as you've just heard from Christina. And they are already uprooted on a regular basis at, in order to serve our country. And each move takes a toll on families. And for kids to move from one school to the other unnecessarily is adding an already heavy burden to them. Um, students have their identities. Um, students are all, the students that are already suffering for socioeconomic mental health or have special needs, undergoing that huge change will have a huge impact on them to understand their new surroundings. Rezoning now is going to undercut all the new programs that you guys have started. Your programs like Pathways and many others that have the potential to make a huge impact. You have great new leaders in administration that are starting to do great things. Don't cut their momentum out. The PTSA for Lafayette has just become a school of excellence this year by the Virginia PTA. We have great schools here. They're all great. But don't displace our high schoolers because we haven't fixed the real problem yet. Wait till we fix the real problem to do that for them. Um, I just want to thank you for your service, your time, your commitment to addressing students as they grow academically, socially, thank you, and Ms. emotionally. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Andrew Langer. Okay. Jennifer Tisdale. Hi, my name is Jennifer Tisdale, and I live in Powhatan Secondary, and I'm here to talk about the issues of redistricting in my neighborhood and the capacity issues in the high schools. Kids in my neighborhood have been in Jamestown over three years. Now, that may not seem like a long time to some people, but for these kids, it's a large portion of their lives. Though I'm only a sophomore, I've already made so many connections at Jamestown. I've met countless friends and teachers, and I currently play on the Jamestown tennis team. Imagine how it's like for kids who have been there three years instead of one like me. You have mentioned that one of the reasons for redistricting is capacity. And as a student, I think I offer a unique insight to this issue at Jamestown. And I can say that I've never experienced any issue with this. We never run out of chairs in classrooms, and at lunch, many seats are left empty. To completely disrupt 155 kids' high school experience over this would be against the school board's mission of, quote, pursuing excellence and championing the success of all students. Let us continue our journey at Jamestown and finish what we've started. I, complete, I recommend you adopt a grandfathering plan for us at Powhatan Secondary and all around the high school and all those neighborhoods. Please do not redistrict Powhatan Secondary and the high schools at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tisdale. Jani Lissagor. Uh, my name is Janie Lissagor, and I thank you for letting me speak. Um, I wanted to speak to you on the rezoning of the high schools and redistricting, and I concur with um, others that have spoke tonight. My community, um, since I've lived in Williamsburg, James City County, have gone through two redistrictings, one at the elementary and one in the middle, and I understand it's necessary. Um, however, I would say with the high schools, it is rash to do it at this point. When you, if you do it at this point, you're still going to have three high schools that are at near occupancy. The problem is still exist. You also have issues. They talk about proximity. If you do do this, uh, this year we've had trouble with busing, not enough buses. The high schools go to school um, first and then the buses have two more rounds to pick up. If you're going in further distance with the buses, that's going to take even longer to transport those children. 
um, that's a problem that's going to have to be looked at. The ultimate of what we're going to all have to look at is that a new high school is going to have to be built. I know that that's easier said than done, but that's really what we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lissigler. If your name um, wasn't called, then it will be called at the public comment section of the um, regular meeting, which is immediately followed by this public hearing. Um, and so with, with that, I will uh, call this public hearing to a close. Oops, sorry, without hitting the microphone, sorry. Thank you. Okay, um, with that, we are, um, our next item is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Tisdale, would you mind come leading us in the pledge? Before you leave. <laughs> mind? I'll just wait until everybody. Can you just wait just a second until everybody? Do you mind? You don't have to. Oh, do you want me to say the pledge? Yeah, do you mind leading oh, us? Oh, yeah, yeah. You got okay. three words. Okay. Ready? Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Tisdell. Ms. Tisdell is a sophomore, I believe, at Jamestown and plays on the tennis team, right? Thank you. that. She was pretty impressive. She was very good. <laughs> Ms. Serza? You might, if it's, it's like everybody, yeah. Just wait. I'll do a recess maybe after um, oh. after uh, citizens' comments because I don't think we're far enough in yet. Mm -hmm. Here, how many do you have for citizens' comments? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Mr. Kelly, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Madam Chair, I'd like the motion for approval of the agenda as presented with the exception of pulling 8.06 <coughs> off the consent agenda and adding it to the action items Probably 9.07. No policy GCBAA. Yes, ma'am. Can I have a second for that, please? Second. second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Can we get the roll, Ms. Serza? Ms. Ownby. Here. Aye. 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 <laughs> Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. I forgot to ask for a discussion. Sorry about that. Um, I'm sure it's okay because everybody voted for it. Um, with that, that brings us to 5.01 announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair. On Friday, October 6th, WJCC, in collaboration with the Association for Manufacturing Excellence and Jim City County, is giving students from all three high schools the opportunity to participate in the fifth annual Manufacturing Day. Throughout the day, local manufacturers in Williamsburg, Jim City County and surrounding areas open their doors to demonstrate the potential of modern manufacturing and to foster interest in a variety of manufacturing careers. Students will have the opportunity to tour two modern day facilities and, review, and receive an overview of the company and its day-to-day -day operations. The National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association is pleased to announce that Kenny Edwards, Athletic Director at Jamestown High School, has been recognized by the association as a certified athletic administrator. To earn this distinction, Mr. Edwards has demonstrated the highest level of knowledge and expertise in the field of inter interscholastic athletic administration. 
The voluntary certification process included a thorough evaluation of Mr. Edwards' educational background, experience, and professional contributions, as well as a rigorous, comprehensive written examination. Kenny Edwards is one of an elite group of interscholastic athletic administrators nationwide to attain this level of professionalism. Congratulations for this significant professional accomplishment. Last Tuesday evening, Ms. Birder, our Chief Financial Officer, was appointed as Chief Financial Officer for Chesterfield County Public Schools. Ms. Bird, I want to thank you for your, for your work in WJCC. You've been a right hand to me for three years now, and we will miss you terribly. Thank you for your excellent work. Thank you for your dedication, and congratulations on your promotion. We wish you well. And finally, this evening, we are annually required to make sure that our community is aware that current copies of all division policies and regulations are available on the division's website, wjcschools.org. Printed copies of school division policies and regulations are available to citizens who do not have online access. Those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Ownby? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I attended the Special Education Advisory Committee meeting on September 14th. That was the first meeting of the year. They are currently taking applications for membership. Um, that application period closes on September 21st. This year they hope to recruit a student representative, and so they are working with special education teachers um, in our schools to help recruit a student to serve as a member. They hope to be able to survey families in the division who have children who are currently receiving an IEP to kind of get a, a gauge on um, satisfaction, and so they plan to talk some more about how that will look. Um, in honor of Disability Awareness Month, the um, Parent Educational Training and Advocacy um, Committee, along with the Parent Resource Center, is hosting seminars throughout the division on uh, transition, communication, and family engagement. So I encourage people to check out Peach Jar. Information will be on the division website. The first workshop will be held in October, I believe, at Warhill High School. Um, respite night for um, children with disabilities and their typically developing siblings will be held at WISC on October 21st. There's more information about that through the One Child Center for Autism. And Parks and Recreation came to the SEAC meeting to share that they have their newest brochure is out with lots of information and, and options for children who have disabilities. They have a new sensory program for students. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Ombi. Ms. Hummel? Hi, I just wanted to um, let everyone know that on Sunday, uh, September 10th, Dr. Uh, Heron and I attended the WJCC Foundation Retreat, uh, where we had a wonderful um, chance for the entire board to meet and um, kind of break into different sessions about how the WJCC Schools Foundation can uh, keep the momentum going with the innovation grants and um, I just wanted to let everyone know now this year it's going to be uh, you can as a teacher apply for the grant uh, online or through the same way that you did it last year uh, and to be on the lookout for the application on the WJCC Foundation website uh, it'll be due in early November and then we're also giving teachers the opportunity to submit for grants at a later time during the year too if this time frame doesn't doesn't work for you uh, and then just on another note uh, as a as a proud lacrosse parent uh, for many many years both my children were uh, playing in women's lacrosse and uh, men's lacrosse and I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Heron for uh, meeting with some of the the folks that are looking at bringing lacrosse to WJCC as a as a sanctioned sport and just to keep the conversation going so I just wanted to put a plug in there for lacrosse Thank you, Madam Chair. On September 13th, Mrs. Hummel and I um, attended the School Liaison Committee with, with the representatives of our funding partners, uh, the City Council and the Board of Supervisors. We talked about several things, including redistricting process, the update on the construction of the fourth middle school, the naming of the fourth middle school, and uh, some other things. So it was a good discussion and, uh, and a good, re good uh, rapport with our funding partners. So, Anyone else? 
That brings us to uh, 6.01 uh, board recognitions. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have seven, several recognitions this evening. We begin by recognizing Laura Tripp for being named a recipient of the National PTA's Lifetime Achievement Award. Laura began her 12 years with the PTA at James River Elementary. She then served first as secretary and then for two years as president of the PTA at Berkeley Middle School and then as vice president and president at Jamestown High. Her PTA career culminated this past year when she served as president of the PTA Council for the whole division. And I really appreciate it working with Laura and her partnering with us and for her advocacy on the PTA Council. This distinguished honour this evening is given to committed leaders who passionately advocate for the education and well-being of children. Laura, congratulations. Bird Baker Elementary and the Clara Bird PTA have been recognized as a 2017 through 19 National PTA School of Excellence for their commitment to building strong family partnerships. This designation is awarded when a PTA and school have achieved a high level of family engagement <clears throat> or when a PTA and school have made substantive positive improvement in families' perceptions by the end of the school year. Principal Mike Hurley, Assistant Principal Angel Washington and PTA President Heidi Feister have joined us at Upfront to be recognized. Congratulations to the entire Clara Bird community on this outstanding accomplishment. The Association of School Business Officials International has awarded WJCC's Finance Department a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2016. This is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. In addition, the Government Finance, Finance Association of the United States and Canada also recognized the Finance Department for their comprehensive annual financial report. With Chief Financial Officer Christ Christina Berta and Comptroller Renee Ewing, please join us up front to accept these awards on behalf of the Finance Department. Congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. We are excited to recognize the Jamestown High School Eagles for winning the 2016-17 VHSL Conference 4A Wells Fargo Cup. This recognition is determined using a point system on performance in state championship events. Across 27 sports, the Eagles earned a total of 405.5 points in VHSL state level competition. This prestigious accomplishment could not have been possible without the hard work and support of all Jamestown's coaching staff and teams. With Principal Kathy Worley and any JHS coaches in attendance this evening, please come forward to accept this award on behalf of the school.
Well, let, let's say congratulations. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> During the Classrooms Not Courtrooms Institute held by the Virginia Department of Education this summer, Governor McAuliffe and the Virginia Department of Education recognized WJCC's school success in implementing the Virginia tiered system of supports. The school division received a distinction in implementation of behavioral intervention award for our systematic approach to meeting the behavioral and social needs of students. Accepting the award this evening on behalf of the division level MTS, MTSS team is Stephanie Bourgeois, Senior Director of Student Services, and Dr. Anne Neve, Supervisor of Student Intervention Programs. Williamsburg James City County Public Schools and five individual schools earned the 2017 Virginia Index of Performance Awards for Advanced Learning and Achievement. The VIP Incentive Program recognizes schools and divisions that exceed state and federal accountability standards and achieve goals of excellence established by the Governor and the State Board of Education. I'd like to ask the principal and members of the administrative teams to join us up front as your school is called. Please remain for the group photograph for our VIP schools. First of all, Matoka Elementary. <laughs> and Jamestown High, if I don't think they're represented this evening, Dr. Worley has just left. They both earned the 2017 Board of Education Excellent, Excellence Award for meeting all state and federal accountability benchmarks and making significant progress towards goals for increased student achievement and expanded educational opportunities set by the state. Congratulations. <laughs> Williamsburg James City County Public Schools merited division recognition and DJ Montague Elementary and Stonehouse Elementary and Lois Hornby Middle all merited school recognition by earning the 2017 Board of Education Distinguished Achievement Awards. This award recognizes divisions and schools for meeting all state and federal benchmarks and making progress towards the goals of the governor and the state board. Congratulations all of our schools for these awards this evening. A job very well done. Chair, that concludes recognitions for this evening. We will have more recognitions at the regular meeting in October. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. That brings us to um, item 7.01, citizens' comments. We have 15 remaining cards, so um, everyone will, um, to keep it consistent with the public hearing, will have two minutes. Um, Ms. Hummel, would you please instructions? I would be delighted to. Okay, everyone. Uh, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker tonight is allocated two minutes, and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. 
Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you. Tony Small. My name is Tony Small, and I'm a resident of James City County. Um, when we bought our house in James City County, our oldest daughter was 10 months old, and our neighborhood was zoned for Clara Burr Baker Elementary, Berkeley Middle, and Jamestown High School. The year before she started kindergarten, we were rezoned for Matthew Whaley. The year before she started third grade, we were rezoned to Matoka. The year before she started middle school, we were rezoned to Hornsby. We have never moved from this house um, that our children have grown up in, but the schools keep changing. My oldest just graduated and is her first year of college. I believe one main reason for her success is her four years of consistency in the same high school where she had opportunities to learn from her teachers who got to know her over those four years. I am also the parent of two 10th graders currently attending Jamestown High School, and I would like the same consistency for them. Studies show that mobility, including redistricting, can have a negative impact on academic achievement and that older students are more likely to be affected. They can also, um, excuse me, they also show that changing high schools during the last two years can have the most negative impact on students' future potential. There is precedent in Virginia and other school districts to allow for grandfathering of existing enrolled students. Rising 10th through 12th grade students were grandfathered at Fairfax High School until graduation. Henrico County's recent redistricting only applied to students who are currently in fifth grade or younger. Students who were in middle and high school in 2016, 2017 are not affected by that redistricting plan. Stafford County also recently completed a high school redistricting and approved grandfathering for all current Colonial Forge High School students as well as a sibling option. Please consider allowing all existing enrolled students to stay at their current high school to finish out the remaining years. And I'll be submitting uh, lengthier comments later. Thank you. Small. Catherine Varco Alva. Rochelle Johnson. Kelsey Smoot. Nairuti Shastri, Glenn Jones, William Riley, Beth Kluger, Good evening, I'm Beth Kluger, I'm a resident of James City County. I have an eighth grader at Berkeley Middle School and a son who's a senior at Jamestown. Can't believe it. Um, and what I heard at the beginning of the meeting when you were giving the introduction was that there were kind of two reasons for looking at the high school redistricting, possibly. Um, one is overcrowding. Um, and the second, um, what I heard was that there was a reduced price because it was an add-on service from the consultant. Um, I texted my son during the first part and if you'll humor me while I open my phone <laughs> to see what he said, I asked him, have you ever felt that Jamestown is overcrowded? And when? Well, he's a jokester, and he wrote back, during fire drills sometimes. And I said, no, seriously, have you ever felt crowded at school? How is lunch? And he said, it is not crowded. So I would like to reiterate what Ms. Tisdale said from a student's perspective, that it is not crowded. He has had all four years at Jamestown. And so I encourage you to look at the reasons why you're redistricting the high schools. Where is it overcrowded? He has not had a problem getting into the classes that he needs. He has not felt unsafe at the school at any time. Um, he has the space he needs to succeed in school. So I would just question why you're looking at redistricting if the high schools, if that is indeed what you intend to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kluger. Amy Baker. Thank you. Madam Chair, Dr. Heron, members of the board, um, my name is Amy Baker, and my husband and I have three children who are currently attending public high school in James City County. Um, I'm here tonight to let you know that I'm opposed to redistricting redistricting the high schools at this time. 
Um, please do not rezone our high schools at this time. I think we've pretty much established here tonight that um, we realize that our schools are nearing capacity, um, all of them, and if we redistrict now, we will have to revisit this again in a fairly short period of time. That means we'll have to disrupt children and families, both now and again later. Um, high school students, um, I think anyone who knows the high school students know they're dealing with lots of issues at this age, um, and it's a variety of life issues. Um, so please don't make things harder for them by making them change schools after they've already started in any given high school. Um, so I'd like to ask you to take high school rezoning off the table until it's absolutely necessary. I think it's unprecedented in James City County to rezone without having a new school opening or closing. Um, so if we move kids around right now, it could seriously disrupt the kids who are currently in high school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Philip Canada. Good evening. My name is Philip Kennedy, and I'm a resident of James City County. Um, I'm going to speak quickly about three things. The first thing that many are not willing to accept is our achieving gap. Uh, I am a res lifelong resident here, and I am a graduate of Lafayette High School as well. Um, but when I look at the achievement gap and it's not moving, I look at Laurel Lane. They had a 39-point achievement gap in reading. That's significant. I look at James River, a 39-point achievement gap in science. I look at Matthew Whaley, a 53-point achievement gap in science for black students, and a 75-point achievement gap for our students with special needs. But for somehow, this achievement gap does not seem to be an important enough issue to address in our community. So that's the first thing with the achievement gap. The second, uh, minority teacher hiring here in Williamsburg, James City County. Uh, last year, uh, in 2016, 2016, 17, we hired 15 new minority teachers. 40% of those teachers have already left the school division. So we need to look at the culture that we're establishing within our school system if we are already struggling to get minority teachers here, and then when we get minority teachers here, 40% of them are leaving the district after one year. And this is a continual thing that has happened not just last year. So that is an issue that we have to take a look at and not keep burying our head in the sand that. The last thing is a program evaluation for James River. I stood here last year um, in reference talking about James River, how we've had the IB program going on 10 years now, and we have yet to do a program evaluation of James River to compare how the students at James River perform compared to our other schools that are not IB schools to see if we are truly getting the biggest bang for our buck for the money we keep pouring into James River every year. We do have good schools, make no doubt about it. But the amount of money we spend every year sending to James River, we need to look at a program evaluation of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Adam Gershwitz. <laughs> Not Adam Gershwitz. Julie Henry. Andrew Langer. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Andrew Langer. I'm a James City County resident. I have two children in the school system, a 10th grader at Jamestown and a 8th grader at Hornsby. Uh, I am a public policy professional. Having done uh, public policy for the last 25 years, I have a master's in public administration. And I'm speaking today in opposition to redistricting at this present time. Uh, it's very clear uh, in terms of talking with parents and, and community members that there is, a lot of, uh, there is a great deal of confusion and opacity when it comes to the reasons why we are doing this at this time. Uh, obviously understanding that there are schools that are nearing capacity, uh, it, clearly there is a debate and discussion that must be had over whether or not a new school is needed. But before we decide to start shifting students around, we need to actually have that discussion and engage in some long-range planning. There's one thing I know in the 25 years that I've been working on public policy issues is that the most well-intentioned policies eventually bump up against very real realities. And if you're not focusing on the fundamentals, if you're not focusing on what it is you're trying to change, then no matter what you do uh, in terms of rearranging deck chairs, uh, you're never going to achieve what it is that you want and you will have scads of unintended consequences. That's really what we're talking about here. I believe in educational equity. 
I believe that every student must have those opportunities. But what it means is we need to focus on making sure that each and every one of our schools is excellent in its own way. My other concern, deep and abiding here, it's something that was addressed earlier, is the issue of opportunity and forced opportunity. That's really what we're talking about here in terms of redistricting. See, you see, people in this community, they've bought or they've rented in places, it's by their own choice. Great amount of research went into it. They have chosen to live where they want to live based upon a whole variety of factors, schools being one of them. But what you're talking about here is, is engaging in a public policy outcome through forced relocation. And I believe that that is fundamentally wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Langer. Corey Butchum. <laughs> Dana and Middleton? Two cards. Two cards for each. <laughs> Any other cards? That is it. Okay. With that, citizen comment period is over. I'm sorry? It was after 6.30. Oh, it was after 6.30? Okay. That's, who is it? It's Hundley. It's Hundley. Oh, Miss Hunley. She has gifts. <laughs> Parking was bad. Um, <laughs> as the president of the Education Association, I want to say welcome back to a new school year. Also to let you know that my exec board and all of our members, we're here to support you in any way we can. Um, I know a couple years ago I gave you the Apple lesson, but many, many years ago, way back when, teachers um, could not be married, and so a lot of teachers lived with families for their um, payment because parent, uh, families could not pay teachers. And then they would pay them through their crops which was mainly potatoes, which is interesting. And then I think along the line when Johnny Appleseed came through with all his wonderful variety of apples and teachers started teaching the letters of the alphabet, A for apple, that's when it became that teachers would get an apple um, from, the, from their students. Um, I went to three different stores because I knew there were eight of you and I believe in diversity and I wanted everybody to get a different apple. And um, not one store had all eight. So I went to three different stores and made sure that you each got a apple that is high in nutrition, because you all will need it this season, um, all the nutrition you can get. So I just wanted to let you know I wanted to put them out for you, but um, where I had to park, um, I did not have an opportunity to do that. So, um, But just wanted to let you know that I'm glad that the one um, thing on the national board uh, policy was pulled off. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, because our point of pride, number seven, says WJCC is home to 52 national board certified teachers. And as a national board teacher myself, um, we don't want to, to mess with that because that's something we're very proud of and that's something we should continue. So thank you for pulling that. I will leave these apples with you. And Thank you, Ms. Henley. Sorry about your difficulties parking. Um, before we move to the consent agenda, I'd like to just, does anyone need a recess? I'll check in periodically. <laughs> um, okay, so that brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, hold on. Let me write down, check for recess here soon. All right, um, that brings us to the consent agenda. Item 8.01, approval of minutes from the following meetings, um, August 15th, 2017 and uh, September 5th, 2017. Uh, 8.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, August 2017. 8.03, personnel actions as presented in closed session. 8.04, resolution R-16-17, bullying prevention month. Uh, 8.05, retire policy, GDC slash GED, support staff recruitment, hiring policy and procedures. Um, and then the new 
Item 8.06, Resolution R-15-17, National Disability History and Awareness Month. May I have a motion, please? Chair, I move consent agenda. Second. Is there any discussion? So move, moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll? Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to action items 9.01 June 2017 financials and 2017 year end spending plan. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the June 2017 financial report and 2017 year end spending plan. I have a second, please. Second. Moved and seconded. Dr. Heron, would you like to speak to this? Um, there were some minor changes in, this, in the year-end spending plan that I asked Ms. Berta to address just with the closing out of uh, the school year. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Just a reminder, as I stated at your last board meeting, that this is still preliminary and unaudited. It is still fluid, while I don't think there's going to be substantial changes um, in the amount of return to the county and city. You will notice that all of the items remain the same as presented in our year-end spending plan from the last meeting. And there is a return at the bottom of that um, presentation to the county in, in the amount of 678881 and to the city in the amount of 70932 So it is based on the contract percentages, and it does allow for the support of the $600,000 return to the county for future CIP needs. Are there any questions for Ms. Berta? Um, well, thank you very much for your hard work on this. I really appreciate it. Um, it would be wonderful if you'd keep us abreast of the dates that, um, as this gets forwarded to the locality. So I can actually tell you this evening. Excellent. Um, October the 10th at 5 p.m. is the Board of Supervisors agenda for this um, agenda item. And October the 12th at 2 p.m. is the City of Williamsburg's meeting. Thank you very much. Sure. Been moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to item 9.02, award a contract for request for proposal number 18-11742, engineering services for the Laurel Lane Elementary School HVAC replacement. May I have a motion, please? Chair, I move award a contract for request for proposal 742 engineering services for the Laurel Lane Elementary School project to Mosley Architects in the amount of two hundred nine thousand seven hundred five dollars. Second. Second. Dr. Heron, do you have? I um, think there are no changes from last time, Mr. Snipes. Anything to add? No, nothing to add tonight. Any questions for Dr. Heron, Mr. Snipes? Uh, I guess it might be a function of being a public body, but it, the, the difference is $123 from what we funded to, to what the bid was. Call it what you will. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> Interesting. Go. All right. Will you call the roll, Ms. Serza, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. <clears throat> Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to item 9.03, uh, award a contract for request for propo proposal number 18-11741, engineering services for the Jamestown School HVAC replacement. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move award a contract for proposal number 18-11741, engineering services for the Jamestown High School HVAC replacement project to Thompson Consulting Engineers in the amount of $319,967. Second, please. Second. Dr. Heron. Mr. Snipes. Mr. Snipes. No additional. Any questions? Comment. With the Same comment? Would you like to do no. Again? Nope. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Can you call the roll, Ms. Serza, please? Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. 
That brings us to item 9.04, naming the fourth middle school. Can I have a motion, please? I move that we name the fourth middle school, James Blair Middle School. Second? Second. Um, is there any discussion? Dr. Heron, do you have anything? Um, just one comment that we had 139 respondents on that provided comments on the naming of James Blair Middle School, or sorry, the fourth middle school, and uh, 95 of those were in favor of naming the school James Blair. And were there comments against naming the school James Blair Middle School? I don't recall any specific again, but, the, but there were other suggestions for naming, but Ms. Overcamp Smith maybe can speak to that a little bit better. We had a couple that said Williamsburg Middle School, and then a couple uh, about other names, and several that were not serious contenders. So, so going forward from here, the, the school is James Blair Middle School, and uh, we will, mascots and school colors all comes from administration and going forward? That's correct. We will take it from here, and a committee will be formed to consider the mascot and other aspects of opening the middle school. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, before we vote, I would just like to um, make clear that this really was an administrative process um, in response to Virginia Department of Education rules, and really a formality, and I was uh, frankly disappointed how it was portrayed in the media. Um, and uh, I think it caused some unnecessary angst, and um, that is unfortunate. But um, I'm glad we are doing this tonight, and then uh, can go forth and mascot and color away. So, <laughs> Sirs, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Fourth Middle is now named. Brings us to item 9.05, re-adoption of standard operating procedures. Um, can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that for the adoption of the school board standard operating procedures, SOP. Somebody may I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Come on, Ms. Taylor. I think we just made that small change um, regarding communication um, that we had at the bottom of our correspondence for our online communication. So as long as no one has any issues with that, I think we're ready to go. Any other comments or questions? We moved and seconded. Ms. Sosa, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. Sirza, can I request that you send us all the, that new email blurb and so that we can just cut and paste it into our iPhones? Certainly. That, thank you very much. That would be great. That would, yeah, that would be. Thank you. Um, that brings us to 9.06, permanent easements and conveyance of real property to the city of Williamsburg. Motion, please. Madam Chair, I move approve permanent easements and conveyance of real property of the City of Williamsburg through Resolution R-1817, <clears throat> deed of fee simple conveyance and deed of non-exclusive easement. Second. Second. Seconded. Anything you would like to add, Dr. Heron? No, ma'am. No changes from last time. Yeah, and all that really says is that, that we're meeting our commitments to building the middle school. To what we've already agreed to. Right. Yes. Sir, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The motion passes. That brings us to item 9.07, policy GCBAA, professional staff, national board certifi certification recognition. Mr. Kelly, may I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move to send action item 9.07, retire policy GCBAA, professional staff, national board certification recogni recognition to committee. It's a second. 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 Okay. Um, did you want to clarify which committee? Policy committee. Thank you. 
Um, is there any? Um, yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, there we go. During our work session last uh, last time, I had a few reservations about deleting this policy, and uh, after the meeting and re on reflection, I really felt that it wasn't a good idea. One of the main jobs of a school board is to set policy. Um, this policy is a clear message that the school board supports and encourages teachers to achieve national board certification. It is a message to our teachers, to our community, and to future school boards that this board believes that that is an important distinction. Um, we were not, uh, there was some discussion, we were not looking to the deletion of this policy as a first step towards elimination of the national board certification stipend. I know this board member strongly supports the stipend and I believe all the board members up here do for those teachers who successfully complete this arduous process. I'd like to thank the other board members for their support of, of um, returning this policy to the committee and the message it sends to our teachers and the community. That said, the, the, we do need to uh, uh, send a policy to the committee for review because one of the things I think this policy talks about is the certification is good for 10 years, and I think it's five years now, and the, I just think we need to, a couple of things in there that we need to uh, clarify in that policy. So. Anybody else? Um, yeah. The other thing I think I'd like to bring to the table is um, the fact that once um, teachers do get the certification, if they then are promoted into kind of an administrative role, they lose that stipend, and um, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right to me. It just doesn't seem fair. So that, but maybe that's just my opinion. And so I wouldn't mind some discussion about about keeping the stipend, um, regardless of whether you're actively teaching students or whether you're in an administrative role. Dr. Beers? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was under the impression, um, and I went back and corrected myself, that, uh, that uh, the language of one uh, policy was found in the language of another policy. And I realized um, that that was not true. And um, um, like Mr. Kelly, um, I, f I feel that's a, uh, a professional recognition by a national organization that requires a tremendous amount of work. Um, and I think um, I'm, um, I, I, I applaud the fact that we have as many national board certified um, teachers um, as we have. And so I don't want that language to disappear. And so I, um, I don't know, you know, getting around it or, but I, I, I want it on uh, the record that the board really supports that recognition that, that um, it's, it's um, it, it may be the highest form of professional recognition by a national organization. It requires a lot of work. That's all I would say. Zombie. And then just maybe to Dr. Beers's point, I think, um, for me, as a policy committee works to review policies, I know one of the criteria that we've looked at is, is aligning our policies with VSBA, and I think that is that is a criteria to consider. However, I don't have angst if we have a policy that that is distinct and different from something that VSBA has, because we are a local school board. And for that reason, I think it's okay for us to have our own policies, so they don't always need to exactly align with VSBA. Um, I, want, I want to concur with what's been said. First of all, um, it's unfortunate that, because I think when we did this, I did assume that this was going to be addressed with a VSBA policy. Having found out that that was not the case, and being a school teacher and having many friends who have gone through the arduous, uh, painstaking work of getting national board certification, that is something that we want to encourage and recognize in our school division. Um, so I'm happy that we have we are going to go back and take another look at this and keep that as a board policy, um, because I, I teachers don't get enough recognition as it is. Just they're they're on the front lines and um, somebody who goes over and beyond deserves that recognition. So I totally support that decision to have it re looked at and to keep it. Um. 
couple of follow-ups to other comments that were made. Uh, first to Mrs. Hummel, um, the, the, when we first started the, the board recognition of, of um, the uh, National Board Certified Teachers, the object was that it was for classroom teachers only. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the classroom teachers were, were getting that certification. Um, I don't know that we necessarily thought about teachers that moved out of the classroom into a, another academic setting. So uh, I would certainly think that if you, you, know, you get it as a, as a teacher and then you move to an administrative position, I think that I would support that we would, we would continue that stipend and continue that recognition going forward. And uh, to Mrs. Owenby's point about the VSBA policy, I think this would be a great policy for VSBA to adopt as one of their model policies and, uh, and, and uh, pass that around to uh, other school systems in the Commonwealth because I, I think it's a good thing for the Commonwealth, uh, the school systems to support. So. To, to follow on with what um, Mr. Kelly said, um, the way that it works now, if someone is a teacher and is receiving that stipend and then they have an opportunity to move into an administrative role to perhaps take their skills and serve a greater number of students, they actually are, um, are not remaining even whole and they might be in a situation where they are actually taking a pay cut to receive the promotion. And that just doesn't seem right to me. So as a member of the policy committee, I'm happy to, to take another look at this. Um, the, but again, this procedure was never going to go away. It just wasn't going to be in the policy. But I'm happy to have it as a policy and look at it again and, and fix some inconsistencies. Uh, just one, one comment is that the administration is very much in favor of recognizing national board certified teachers. We highly value our teachers and, and certainly support it going back into policy committee as well from an administrative perspective. Um, I, I think that uh, as it, it was pointed out earlier that is, it is a point of pride and I don't think this division would have put that on the point of pride if it didn't intend to keep this um, and, and so I want to thank those uh, people who reached out to us to alert us that it, you know we don't do our jobs very well in a vacuum so that um, that outreach is really important so thank you for that uh, generally speaking I do support keeping our policies in line with VSBA um, but there are reasons when that doesn't work uh, what comes to mind is one policy that VSBA doesn't have is about research being done in our schools and because we are next door to William and Mary it makes sense for us to have that. Um, for me um, I support sending this back to um, the policy committee. I support the idea of teachers who have gone through this arduous process not being harmed uh, if they take a promotion. That seems um, backwards. Um, but I, I just want to make sure that this is the right way to, to, to send that statement. I, I'm not and I look to administration to guide us on that. I'm not convinced that it's a policy. It may indeed be a policy. But what I want to make sure is that, it, that this body, the people who are here now or the people who are here 10 years from now, um, can't take away that stipend, stipend with one vote. So because we adopt that book every year where the stipends are in it. And so if for some reason, because we have a tight budget year, that stipend disappears, then with one vote we can take it away. But, ne but if we keep the policy, we'd have to rescind the policy and then take that vote. So I, I, and so I don't know if it lives in a policy or in some other place, but I just want to make sure that it's like a double step process that we can't in one fell swoop take that away. Does, does that make sense? So um, I just, I don't know if the policy is the best way, but just as long as that kind of double protection is there, if you will. That's, you all think about that as you read the policy committee as you are in your deliberations. So anyway, we will send this back to policy committee if, if we all vote on this tonight and then it'll come back to us in the next couple months. Right. Anything else? Shall we vote? Just about to call. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Rosa, will you roll please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? 
Aye. The motion passes, and this will go back to committee. And Mr. Uh, Kelly reminds me that I have forgotten to ask for a vote before, so uh, thank you. All right, is everybody okay? I want to check in on a recess. We're good? Good. All right, that brings us to item 10.01, Capital Development Committee's recommended FY 2019-2028. CIP. Um. Thank you, Madam Chair. As, as the board are aware, we established a new process two years ago where we developed uh, the capital improvement plan with the help of a committee, and Ms. Berta has been leading that committee this year and is here tonight to bring the recommendations of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. As we begin the fiscal year 2019 budget development process, you will recall several years ago we modified the budget process to present the capital improvement plan separate from the operating budget. As I'm presenting to you this evening, please remember that this is a presentation is just a first look. It's preliminary and still a working document. The administration and operations teams are continuing to evaluate and fine tune projects scope of projects, and the cost estimates received. We formed the Capital Improvement Com uh, Development Committee in the summer of 2017. There's quite an extensive list there that I won't bore you with um, that make up that committee. But I will highlight that there are two community members that participated in this committee. One being Dr. Randy Casey Rutland from Newtown Management and Mr. Van Dobson, uh, the Facilities Director from William & Mary. Again, the process started earlier to allow for the work of the committee to happen, community input via two public hearing opportunities, and school board review and input. Call center managers were asked to submit their request for projects, and then the committee evaluated those requests. The committee met three times during the CIP process, reviewed the request, and evaluated the facility condition index recommended projects. To provide context, the following information was provided to the committee. Building capacity versus enrollment analysis, both current and future. The cost center project request. A review of the school board approved capital improvement plan versus the estimated county and city funded CIP. And project balances for completed CIP projects that's available for use. Upon the completion of the review, projects were either included in the committee's recommended CIP excluded due to not meeting the city and county required $50,000 threshold per project, or excluded and addressed immediately or addressed in the future through the operations and maintenance operating budget. These decisions, as a result of the committee's work, and as the budget development process continues, will be shared with cost center managers to ensure open communication. Beginning with the fiscal year 2017 to 26 CIP, the school board began to develop a 10-year CIP. The county and city adopt a five-year CIP, and the 10-year CIP allows us as a school division to project and plan for future needs beyond the five-year plan. Tonight, our main focus will be on fiscal year 2019, which is the next immediate funded year. We will review modifications, additions, or deletions to the 2019 um, from the adopted fiscal year 18 five-year plan. As a reminder, all projects include anticipated A&E cost, contingency, and escalation. Um, a project may be new in the CIP or appear for the first time due to us receiving updated information. The following projects, or the following slides will detail increases and decreases in project cost. Faithful and Gold did a facility condition index two years ago and those estimates were based on industry standard. No actual quotes were obtained from contractors. On several projects, staff and third-party evaluations have determined that additional scope and change is necessary to complete the project. The first project in fiscal year 19 that requires a change is the Matthew Whaley chiller and hot water heaters. Operations staff has acquired updated estimates for the replacement. It is a one-year project. The original cost estimate was $136,856, with a revised estimate being received for $389,500. Fairly substantial increase of $252,644, so it's the recommendation of the committee for the operations team to continue to work and acquire additional estimates to ensure that the project is accurately represented in cost. The Matthew Whaley parking lot expansion. 
staff required updated estimates for this replacement. There was a change in scope from the project that was presented in the fiscal year 18 CIP. That change is to incorporate repairs to the front parking lot. We don't want the back parking lot to be corrected without updating the front parking lot. So we are recommending to adjust that to fully uh, repair and to address the parking issues at Matthew Whaley. The original cost estimate was 319,815. The revised estimate is 424,300 for an increase of 104,485. Berkeley Middle School roof replacement. Again, this is an updated estimate received from our operations staff. It is a one-year project. There is a change in the scope from what was presented in fiscal year 18 to replace the roof over 300, 400, and 600 wings. The committee is recommending that we acquire additional estimates to ensure that this is correct. The original cost estimate was 296,700 with a revised estimate of 475,760 or a cost increase of 179,060. The Lafayette roof replacement. This was originally approved in the school board's funding for fiscal year 18 due to the movement that occurred in the county and city's approved CIP uh, due to the way that they're going to try to fund this project. We do need to escalate by one year, um, so that requires 3% escalation. The cost in last year's plan was $2,692,234 with a revised estimate of $2,773,001 or an increase of $80,767. The Lafayette main electrical switch gear. Staff again acquired new estimates. This is a one year project. The original cost estimate was 225,707 with a revised estimate of 112,600 or a decrease of 104,485. Still at Lafayette looking at electrical panels. Uh, we are working with uh, third-party vendor to uh, make sure that the change in scope is accurate on this. Uh, again, this one will go back through our operations staff to make sure it's accurate due to the increased cost on this. The original estimate was 152505 The revised estimate is 427000 an increase of 274495 This is a new project for fiscal year 19. Um, Lafayette has had some sewer line issues that we need to address. Uh, this is a correction of exterior sewer lines at Lafayette. This additional project would be a cost increase to our plan of $180,000. On the next slide, I have um, a picture showing the perimeter of the building. The green line on this graphic is the sewer line that needs to be replaced. Um, I will caution everyone to know that um, we don't know what the interior sewer lines look like, so this could be the start of a fix for Lafayette, um, and this does just address the external sewer lines to that building. Moving forward to Jamestown High School Cafeteria and Commons Edition. It was the recommendation of the committee in last year's process to add this project uh, due to the safety concerns that were brought up um, during that committee presentation and discussions. Uh, based on evaluation of enrollment um, and based on the, the still raised concern by the principal of Jamestown, the CIP Development Committee is asking that this be put back into the CIP. The impact of that would be $2,008,500. Uh, the county and city removed this from their plan last year, awaiting the results of redistricting. Here's some images for you of cafeteria at Jamestown during lunch. Um, this was a nice day, so the students were able to sit out in the um, commons area exterior to the cafeteria. Another addition to the CIP is additional school buses. You will remember that additional school buses are to be requested through the capital improvement plan. Replacement buses are to be requested through the operating budget. Uh, based on the historical data obtained from our transportation department and what typically is needed when schools are open, there is an estimated five additional buses needed to support the opening of James Blair Middle School. I can say that now, I have a new middle school. Uh, five buses would cost us 545000 to accommodate that. Uh, this number will be fine-tuned as the results of redistricting come to life. 
So a snapshot of the next five years. Um, you have two documents before you. One is a spreadsheet that shows you by school um, what the projects are. The other document is a pretty wordy document, but it provides you more verbiage and shows you a breakdown by project type. So over the course of the next five years, we have HVAC repairs and replacements at those schools on the left-hand side and window replacements at Tuano Middle. Those projects represent $22,439,651, or 35% of our five-year CIP plan. Moving forward to roof replacements and or repairs, entrance redesigns, and refurbishments in our schools. Our schools are on a 14-year refurbishment cycle. The total impact over five years is 11455180 or 18% of our total CIP. Looking at other projects, there's quite an extensive list on the right-hand side um, to include auditorium, seating, baseball field refurbishments, the cafeteria expansion at Jamestown, walk-in refrigerators and freezers for our cafeteria department, parking lots, generator replacements, the Lafayette sewer, and then playground equipment, as well as exterior repairs to our facilities, electrical repairs or replacements. Those projects over the course of five years represent 6,474,000 or 650 or 10% of our five-year CIP. Looking at new construction, um, the committee again looked at um, the capacity versus enrollment reports. The data that was available to the committee was last year's enrollment data because we hadn't started school yet when the committee's work began. Um, the, the estimates are coming to life as we're in day 12 of school. Um, so based on the committee's look at what enrollment was as of September 30th of last year, it is recommended that the high school innovation renovations remain until we know what's going to happen with that program. The high school capacity expansion design and construction be added back. That again was removed by the city and county um, awaiting redistricting. And then in the fifth year is the new central office design, which is a result of needing to move central office in anticipation for the need of the second phase of the middle school. So all of those projects total $25,713,435, or 40% of our five-year CIP request. Here's a snapshot of our five-year CIP. Uh, fiscal year 19's request, because that's the immediate funded year, is 18,018,647. Over the course of five years, if all of the projects recommended by the committee remain, is 64,582,580. So at the beginning, I began uh, discussing that there are some completed CIP project balances that are available for use. Um, in the open communication that has occurred between myself and my partners on the city and county side, there are several projects that have been allocated to schools that are completed and there's funding still available. So looking at all of the cost overruns that happened on projects based on updated estimates that have been received, the committee is recommending that we utilize 684,743 of that project balance to support our request for fiscal year 19 CIP. So here's a look at the numbers. Um, our requested CIP again is 18,018,647. When we use the remaining project balances that will require a budget transfer to be approved by all boards, 684,743. It revises our request to 17,333,904. The estimated county and city funding available in CIP was 14,600,404, which leaves us with a gap of 2,733,500. That is directly attributed to the addition of the Jamestown Cafeteria and Common Space, the additional buses, and the Lafayette sewer that's being requested. That is the committee's recommendation. I will be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. And please remember that this is the first look. <laughs> so just out of this moment in time, the that some of the recommendations are based on last year's numbers, as Ms. Berta has said, and as we, before we I bring forward the superintendent's recommendation for the capital improvement plan, we will have this year's numbers. So some of the recommendations may change based on updated enrollment numbers. At this moment in time, there are no additions to any of our high schools in next year planned, even in the design phase 
and based on those numbers I may, I may feel the need to bring those forward earlier or an alternative. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Before I go to board member questions, I just want to confirm with you that this really is etched in jello, if you will, um, <laughs> that this is not your recommendation. It is really a, for our collective information, not necessarily for us to respond to tonight, um, but really in the interest of full disclosure and transparency and what you're doing with the committee and that your recommendation that we should then respond <coughs> to is coming next month. Is that correct? I also anticipate that some of the um, estimates that are currently in this plan are still being reviewed and we're having second estimates and looking at those more closely, especially those that are significantly above what was in the original plan. So we're going back and looking at everything again and making sure that we're not bringing forward anything that does not represent as well. I know this is all, all general. Um, in our liaison meeting uh, last week, uh, one of the J James City County supervisors was interested in knowing what is the expansion capability at each of the high schools, like so that that's something that we would uh, want to get our heads around, like what is possible for future uh, expansion. Um, are we landlocked in certain areas or, you know, whatever, just so that the county kind of has a heads up on what's even possible in the future. So I just wanted. We, we can certainly provide some of that information to the board. I guess so. Um, so one of the reasons why we moved this, we, we separated the, the capital and, and the uh, expense budget operating budget um, was to fold in well with the county's uh, planning commission um, uh, process. Right. Uh, I, I assume that we're still, we're still engaged with them and locked in and, and, and know what their expectations are and what their needs are for us to submit to them and we're, we're working towards a timeline that will support that. Yep, conversations about that actually occurred today. So yes, we're, we're on board together. Good. Um, yeah, once again, there's the as a as a growing school system that we are and uh, the growing system that I foresee that will continue to be we do have capital needs and um, uh, I think we're, we're doing a good job to to help to identify those things and plan those appropriately so appreciate the work of the committee thank you very much we look forward to continuing the discussion <laughs> All right, that brings us to item 11.01, board member comments. Uh, can you just give me a minute? I'm, I'm trying to, to pull them up. Zonby, would you like to? Yes, I just wanted to thank the community for their patience with our busing issues, and we're working through those. And I know it's, it's, it's tough and can be frustrating, but, but bear with us and um, you can help us recruit more bus drivers. That would be great, too. Um, I wanted to thank all the citizens for coming tonight to share their perspective and their experiences, and there's a lot of information and, and, and data that the school board will consider as we begin to refine what the criteria will look like for redistricting. Yeah. Yes, first of all, I do want to thank the community. Um, um, I've, I've enjoyed um, talking to them and understand the concerns. Uh, I just want to re reiterate that the school board is working uh, to be very transparent, <coughs> excuse me, and to make sure that we make the best decision for the community. Um, we know it's not going to be easy, and obviously it's not. So I uh, also want to congratulate Mr. Kenny Edwards for his uh, uh, award of the Athletic Administrator um, Certificate because I think that's an amazing accomplishment. And I want to congratulate again Ms. Berta for... Uh, for her new promotion for Chesterfield Public Schools. I know that I will miss her. I'm sure that we are all going to miss her greatly. Um, so, but I wish her well. Um, I do want to uh, thank uh, the, the teachers and, and know that we are thinking about you and um, you're, you've made it through a few weeks. I hope you don't all look Miss like Miss Huntley. Back there. <laughs> <laughs> because, you mean beautiful. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it would be, yeah, you're right, it would be very painful and uh, 
but I, I've spoken to a couple of teachers and they're excited and, and things are going well. So I want to thank you for that and thank you for the superintendent and for, the, for her cabinet for the job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Dr. Beers? Uh, yeah, I, I want to thank um, um, all the members of the community who showed up this evening uh, to share their uh, views about redistricting um, and also those who um, went online and filled out um, um, our survey, gave us um, input, as well as the emails um, that we also received. Uh, um, it's really important to continue that and uh, um, as you know as, as we all the board knows um, this is a very serious matter has a uh, has um, a, a lot of impact for a lot of uh, positive reasons but uh, um, there are some other issues as well that um, I think parents are concerned about and um, and I think we'll try to consider all of those. Um, I want to um, congratulate the athletic director of Jamestown High School uh, for the award that, um, that he um, has received. And uh, PTA, Claire Bird Baker, um, it just, at every, every, every school board meeting we have, we, uh, we're always recognizing um, staff, teachers, um, people in the community, parents, um, students. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a community-wide school system, and um, and it really shows uh, when we uh, when we see so many um, different people um, involved in the schools and, and being recognized for that. So I uh, uh, I very much appreciate that. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think. I just want to go back real quick to the National Board Certified thing, uh, th uh, policy. I think we did, I did a real good thing tonight and sent a real clear message. Um, I'd also like to thank all the members of the public who came out tonight. I thought we had really good discussion. Um, I really appreciated the tenor and the tone of the, of the uh, conversation and the discussions, even with people who had opposing viewpoints and, and uh, the uh, respectful way that that discussion was prevented, presented. And I think that was... Uh, uh, reflects really well on the on this community as we approach this difficult decision um, and we do have difficult decisions made going forward for, you know, as a criteria then once the uh, district maps come and, uh, decisions are made whether we are going to uh, do high schools or not so I think that's all going to be part of the discussion I would, I would encourage the community to stay engaged um, stay in the discussion and uh, make sure you, you keep uh, presenting your thoughts and opinions and feelings to school boards so, uh, there was mention earlier about uh, our bus drivers and, uh, and how we're working to address the, the shortages of our bus drivers and I, I I do have to say that I do appreciate the work that the bus drivers do for many 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 of our children they are the first school employee that a child sees every day and the last and uh, they have they have a lasting impact on a child's experience and so uh, our bus drivers are uh, are very important too our school system. So I just want to thank them for the work that they do. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel? I just want to concur with what my other school board members have said tonight. Um, I really do appreciate all the people that came out uh, to give us their uh, feedback on the criteria uh, that we should be looking at. I, I also am just continue to just be glad that I live in this community. It's a very civilized um, uh, way of debating the different kinds of uh, topics that come up. And I, I just think we're all very fortunate to live in this community. And keep the emails, keep the uh, calls coming. We, we need, um, we also occasionally, we find out through through the grapevine that there's sometimes miscommunication about the process or about different things. So if you, you feel like you're hearing something and it doesn't make sense, please reach out to your school board member with your question and have things clarified. So. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. I agree. I, I loved all the input that we received tonight. Um, it's so important that we continue to receive that input as we move forward with the process. Um, I appreciate the messages. I think we all read all of 
the emails that we get and um, we process that information and um, and keep coming out to talk to us. Thank you, Mrs. Taylor. I want to say congratulations, Ms. Berter. I'll say goodbye at a later meeting, but congratulations today. I wanted to let everybody know that yesterday I visited James River Elementary with um, Supervisor Larson and City Council Member Ramsey. Um, it was a really great visit, and this year as I go on my school visits, I, uh, in addition to including a, a school member, board member, I'm going to include our, our funding partners because I think it's a really good opportunity to introduce um, I think they have a really good sense, and I think we do a good job of building relationships at the, the division-wide level, but in the school level. So I will be doing that, and we had a great uh, visit, and I wanted to thank James River Elementary staff uh, uh, for taking the time out of their day. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, public safety officials who were here, both law enforcement and fire and life safety, for keeping us safe today. And, and Ms. Serza, thank you for opening the the extra overflow room and working with the library staff. Today was a, a larger meeting than, than normal, so all of you really worked hard to help make this meeting um, happen and keep all of us safe and give everybody an opportunity to, uh, to say what they wanted to say, so thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, I'd like to echo everybody's um, sentiment that uh, you know citizen engagement is not an event. It's not a public hearing. It's a process, so please um, you know, stay engaged throughout not only this process but other processes particularly as it pertains to the um, CIP and making sure that our funding partners are aware of what, your, you know, what the public's uh, will is and, uh, as far as educational space. Um, and uh, Dr. Heron, if I could ask, um, just in the interest of transparency and to keep things uh, you know, clear, at the, on the next agenda at the work session, could we separate middle school redistricting criteria and high school redistricting criteria and have actually two separate conversations so that we're making sure that those conversations are not um, combined? Because one is a certainty and one is a possibility. Do, would you like two separate agenda items? Yes, please. That way, I Absolutely. think it's just in the interest of clarity and full transparency, just to not confuse the public. Um, we heard today um, about the, an interest in continuing to be involved, so I just want to reiterate that every single school board meeting does include an opportunity for public comment. So, um, you know, people asked for public hearings, but public comment does exist, and this board has no interest in, in not hearing people, so if people show up and they want to talk, um, I... I so um, please come. Um, and you know, I also want to um, just reiterate that we have, and you and, and, uh, talked about this, Dr. Heron, a little earlier today, we have asked for expansion space at the high schools, and it, it was not granted to us. And I, and I think it was not granted to us with, with a request to explore redistricting, and we are doing that. This is the next logical step, and we are exploring all options as part of our due diligence work so that when we go back and ask our funders for things, we have gone through a process and getting that includes information and a deeper dive into the needs of our division. So you know, I'm very proud of this board taking on that role and responsibility. Um, I also want to say that we are a growing um, Division and stable divisions redistricting doesn't happen, but we just you know growing growing and shrinking divisions. There are shrinking divisions that are closing schools in our state and have to redistrict for that purpose. And so we're growing and um, redistricting is something that's part of our reality when um, when we're growing. So um, and I, and I um, I just also wanted to comment very briefly because um, some people in our community can choose where they live, but others cannot. Um, in James City County, you have to work three full-time jobs at minimum wage to afford a two-bedroom apartment. Um, there are areas where that are affordable to people who are working in the service sector and there are areas that are not, and I just want all of us to keep in mind that while some of our residents and our family members do, can choose to live wherever they want to, and that's wonderful, others can't, and I just really want to be clear about that. That, is there anything else? Um, with that, that brings us to item 12.01, upcoming events. The policy committee meets on the 20th at 4 p.m. in room 309, and I think we just added to your work. Sounds good. And then um, our uh, next meeting is a closed session on October 3rd at 6 p.m. in the annex at uh, James Blair. 
and uh, followed by a public hearing on the CIP at 6.30, which is then uh, immediately followed by a work session and action items again October 3rd in the annex at, at James Blair. And then our second meeting in October is on the 17th. At 6 p.m. we go into closed session and then followed at 6.30 on the 17th, also a regular meeting uh, here in the City Council. With that, 